Our passage this morning is from Matthew's Gospel. It's Matthew chapter 11. We'll finish out chapter 11, so verses uh, 20 through 30. Please listen to God's word. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of our Lord. Perhaps you heard this in the passage, but maybe not. You surely should remember that the passage ends with a great deal of sensitivity. You see in verse 29, gentle and lowly of heart. A unique expression in the Bible. That's how the passage ends. But do you think it matches very well how the passage begins? Verses 20 through 21, that one who is gentle and lowly of heart is also the one who is judgmental. Full of denunciation. You see that? Woe to you. And if you didn't see that, I'd like for you to remember this as you go from this place. Who has a God who holds all power, the power to judge, even to judge for all eternity, and yet the same God who also has the power to love? A God who is gentle and lowly of heart. Do you see that contrast between the beginning and the end of the passage? I want you to wonder to yourself, who has a God like that? This is one of the many reasons why Christianity is so unique. Our God is all-powerful, the only creator, and he will judge all things, and yet... He comes to us in Jesus Christ and loves and cares for us. A God who is loving and tender and a God who is fearsome and angry. Well, here's what this passage is showing us about this God. Jesus is God's power to provide rest for his children. Indeed, rest for the world. Jesus is God's power To provide rest for his children, indeed rest for the world. I want want us to begin this passage noticing how many names for villages and cities there are. The first point is this. Jesus is introducing us to a city full of gods. A city that's judged. A city full of gods. A city that is judged. Uh, Verses 20 through 24. You see all the city names there, don't you? Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. In many ways, the mention of these three villages is a way that Jesus uses to represent every village in the history of the globe. Every village, every city. But I'm not sure how you assess a city. Nice people, low taxes, beautiful scenery, easy to get to, secluded. I'm not sure how uh, you might assess a village, but you see how Jesus does. Jesus assesses, assesses a city this way. There is a city where the gospel has been and the gospel was received. And then there's a different kind of city, a city where the gospel has been and has not been received. Jesus seems less interested in taxes or commerce or scenery than we are. Is it a city where the gospel has been and received, or is it a city where the gospel has been and not received? 
You know, it's interesting. We don't have, so you know, we don't have examples of uh, mighty works of Jesus, miracles in uh, either Chorazin or Bethsaida. We just don't, not in the Bible. Uh, Jesus uh, was actually in that fishing village of Bethsaida, but we don't know exactly what happened there. The Andrew and Peter, the two brothers who become disciples, they're from Bethsaida. But we just don't know very much about those cities. There's some other cities, aren't there? A Tyre and Sidon are mentioned in verse 22. And these cities were famous for all of the wrong reasons. Uh, virtually no one in uh, Galilee had actually been to Tyre or Sidon. They're not uh, necessarily destinations, but they were famous uh, because they're famous in the Old Testament. And what was Tyre and Sidon famous for? These were cities that no matter how hard the prophets of God argued with them, they refused to believe in God. They're cities that stand out because uh, they're cities that are uh, known for their arrogance, their refusal to believe, their uh, stubbornness, their uh, flagrant wickedness. You see also in verse 24, the mention of another city, Sodom. And perhaps you know enough of the Bible uh, to know that we need not talk about Sodom at all. We already know Sodom is a place that's, well, it's gone. And so Jesus, he's mentioning these, uh, all of these uh, cities, and we begin to wonder, you know, what, what is he up to? But Capernaum, when he mentions that city, well, then we should all pay attention Because Capernaum was, in Galilee, one of the most prominent cities of all. A Roman city, but it was a city in which Jews and Gentiles, they seemed to be in harmony. They they got along well. And sometimes when the money's good, we get along well. Well, Maybe that was the issue with Capernaum. It was a city where people uh, tended to go to pay their taxes. It was, uh, in many ways, the treasury of Galilee, or at least uh, upper Galilee, It was a notable city. Uh, Matthew, of course, who was a tax collector, he was converted uh, in Capernaum. And while it's uh, certainly true uh, that uh, Peter and Andrew grew up in Bethsaida, they moved to Capernaum. Jobs in Capernaum. Fishing jobs in Capernaum. But a couple other disciples of Jesus were also from Capernaum, James and John. They lived and worked there. And it may very well be that after Nazareth, Jesus himself called Capernaum his home. And the timing in Matthew's gospel is a little hard to ferret out. It's difficult to know the order in which events happen. But it's very likely that in Capernaum, Jesus performed many mighty works. Uh, where a few of those are called out. We're just not sure exactly if they've happened or not. There uh, People who are uh, demon-possessed uh, have been liberated from those demons. Uh, paralytics uh, have been healed. Uh, the centurion's uh, servant is healed, and uh, a local ruler's daughter is healed. And, and, and this is all happening in Capernaum. And in fact, it's a city that has a new synagogue. And Jesus, he has preached in that synagogue again We're not sure if it's happened at this point in Matthew's gospel, but in John chapter 6, Jesus preaches his sermon about himself being the living bread of life. That was preached in the synagogue in Capernaum. And of course, the feeding of the 5,000. That was just outside of this city. Everyone would know Capernaum. And it may be that uh, as individuals are are hearing these words, they're wondering, uh, where does Capernaum rank with these cities? And Jesus, he, he makes it clear where Capernaum ranks. You see in verse 23, what does Jesus say? He says, and you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You'll be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. We need to pay attention to the tone. Jesus is calling down judgment on Capernaum. And and Jesus, he's only using one lens. He's not comparing uh, the tax benefits or the beauty of the city or uh, the homeliness of the city. Aren't we so uh, quick to praise our hometown? Jesus will have none of it. 
If you reject the Messiah, that defines everything. And that's what happens in verse uh, 23. I'm sure all of us in this room, uh, if we are Christians, we wish that we knew our Old Testament better. I certainly wish I knew my Old Testament better. But do you know when Jesus in verse 23 is denunciating Capernaum, do you know that he is copying the prophet Isaiah? Those who knew their Old Testament would know that uh, this is from Isaiah chapter 14. This is what Isaiah calls down uh, on uh, the city of Babylon. And in fact, uh, there's more. This is what Isaiah says. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. This is a word of judgment. An unequivocal rejection of God. And God has responded they have said to God, I will ascend, I will set my throne, I will rule over others. And it's hard to know if, if all of the, uh, the Babylonians were like this, or if this was just one king, or if it was uh, several uh, kings of city-states. It's hard to tell. But God is certainly describing how sin works. God calls this not just rejection of him, but he calls it self-worship. And did you know that Christianity does that? You see, uh, you may think that you can live your life in such a way that you, just, uh, you are still evaluating the religions of the world and evaluating your own heart. And you've not picked a team yet. Oh, you probably don't say it that way, but we know that feeling. I'm currently unaffiliated till something rolls around. Going through notes. The Bible says that any rejection of God is actually self-worship. And this is the indictment that's, that's called down upon uh, Babylon. Uh, Babylon is a city in which people are worshiping themselves. Rejection of Jesus is self-worship. But I want you to notice what Jesus does here. In verse 23, Jesus, he's quoting those words from Isaiah 14. Okay, you got that? Jesus is quoting words from Isaiah 14. But he's doing a couple of things that you may not notice. The first thing he's doing when he quotes these words from Isaiah 14 is he is commending his own divinity. In verse 23, you may not see it, Jesus is commending his own divinity. Because you see, the words in Isaiah 14 are words not of Isaiah, but words of God. It is God's judgment on the king of Babylon. And when Jesus quotes that authoritatively in verse 23, he's actually taking the words of God as his own. It's very clear in verse 23 that Jesus is speaking. Jesus is speaking but he's doing, doing so with the authority of God the Father. And God the Father said that to Babylon, and Jesus is saying that to Capernaum. Here's something else Jesus is doing. Jesus is rejecting all human flattery. It's, it's a very interesting. You see, Jesus and Capernaum, they go way back. There's a sense in which they're friends. Jesus knows how people in Capernaum are. People in Capernaum, if there's anyone in the ancient world who would know, these people know Jesus. I mean, he lives down the street. They know his friends. Jesus and the inhabitants of Capernaum, they're, they're, they're like on the same page. They're okay with each other. You know, and, and really, that's, that's how it is if you grew up in a small town, if you grew up in a small neighborhood. You know those people. Those people know you. But none of this matters to Jesus. You see, Jesus is commending his own divinity by quoting the words of Isaiah 14. But he is also doing this. He's rejecting all human flattery. Any kind of relationship that the people in Capernaum feel like they have with Jesus because they're like locals, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. He refuses to accept flattery. Flattery. 
it means nothing. Do you worship me, bow down to me, or not? The flattery gets you nothing at Capernaum. So those two things, uh, maybe you didn't see, but this one I think you will. Uh, Jesus, he's commending his own divinity, he's speaking the words of God, and he's rejecting all human flattery that might come at him from the inhabitants of Capernaum. But the third thing is this, he asserts that he is the only way of salvation. Do you see that expression in verse 23, mighty works? Whose mighty works? His mighty works. Jesus is referring to his preaching ministry. He may be referring to the preaching ministry of the disciples. You know, Matthew chapter 10, that's all about the disciples having the authority of Jesus, able to, to exercise mighty works, but still preaching the message of the gospel. But Jesus is saying, he's saying, I am the only way to salvation. Bow to me and me alone. They're my mighty works. Do you catch that? Those three things Jesus is doing. He's elevating his own divinity, speaking as God. He's rejecting all human flattery. And he's saying, I am the only way of salvation. Now that's an awful lot. But that's how Jesus begins. You see, Jesus is God's power to exact judgment. But he also is God's power to provide rest for his children and for the world. Look what Jesus does next. You see verse 25. This is very strange. Jesus is making a kind of response, a response to his own charge. He's making a kind of response in verse 25 in the form of a public prayer. Do you see how 25 uh, there begins? He begins speaking to God, I thank you, Father. It feels like a prayer. By the way, look at verse 25 and 26. See if you can tell where the prayer ends. I feel like I want to give you time to do that. Can you tell where the prayer ends? It begins at verse 25. But it's so difficult to tell where exactly this prayer ends. It's unclear. I mean, it could go all the way to verse 30, but you read verse 30. He doesn't seem to be speaking to the Father, does he? And then in verse 27, uh, that's a little unsure. 28, uh, come to me all who labor. That's not the kind of expression that you would offer in a prayer. But something seems to happen between 27 and 28. So here's how the sermon outline works. We've just gone through the first main point. And we've been introduced to uh, a city that is full of gods. That's what it means to not believe. To not believe is to be your own God. So a city full of gods. But we're going to look at just verses 25 through 27. And this clearly is a prayer. 25 through 27. Oh, I, should, I should be careful. Verse 27 is a little strange itself. But here, we're actually learning not about a city full of gods, but a city full of children. The city full of gods was judged, but this is a city full of children. And by sharing this prayer, Jesus is informing them. He's sharing something with them. Wouldn't you simply love to hear every prayer that Jesus made in his earthly ministry? Wouldn't you love that? Do you ever wonder how to pray? don't know what to say to him. But here we have an example, at least two verses of an example, of Jesus praying to the Father. Now, if Jesus is indeed praying in public, then there's something about this prayer that he wants the hearers to understand. He's sharing this prayer, and it's very deliberate. And, And I want you to think about this. Again, second point of the sermon, verses 25 through 27. And Jesus is praying, and he's letting you hear the prayer. In the Jones house, we have a kid who is an engineer, and he was always fascinated with these little books that always have cross sections, you know, little diagrams of everything. So it's a, some piece of machinery that's been cut in half so that you can see everything inside of it. You remember uh, an author named Randall uh, Monroe? Uh, what are his books? Uh, the Thing Explainer? Ever heard of those books? Well, when Jesus is praying in public, Jesus is actually giving us an opportunity to see a diagram of his walk with God. We can actually see what's happening. What does it look like for God the Son and God the Father to have a relationship? That's what's happening in a prayer. Wouldn't you love to hear all of the prayers of Jesus? Jesus. 
This prayer, for instance, teaches us that uh, Jesus is not ashamed to boast in the Father's authority. You, you see that? Uh, God is his Father. He calls God my Father in the beginning of this prayer. But he's not afraid to boast of this uh, Father, but this Father has authority. You see, Jesus, he understands all of his life, his mission, all of his own authority has, well, you see his expression, has been handed to him. Do you see that? Jesus is boasting about the authority of the Father uh, to such a degree that all the authority that Jesus has, he says, has actually been handed to me. And Jesus is saying that uh, not just his birth, but his preaching and his mighty works and his teaching and even his prayer life, these things have been handed to him by the Father. He boasts in the Father's authority. But he also boasts in the Father's character. You see what we learn about God the Father in the prayer of Jesus We learn that God the Father, he is the Lord of heaven, that he is the Lord of earth. Remember that strange dichotomy of a God who has the power to judge and also the power to love. It's here in this prayer as well. The one who's the Lord of heaven and the Lord of earth, he's also what? Verse 26, gracious. Who has a God like that? He is the Lord of heaven and earth, and yet he's also gracious. Jesus is not just boasting in the Father's authority, but the Father's character. And, and this surely stood out to you. Do you see how Jesus, he's boasting about the Father's intimacy? You see, Jesus is sure that nobody knows him like the Father. I wonder if there's anyone here in this room who wishes others just knew them. If you just knew me, you would understand why I say the things I say, why I do the things that I do. And sometimes that communication is just impossible to make happen, even with intimate friends. If you just knew me, I wish you could just crawl inside my skin and know me, and then, well, then you'd understand. It's not a struggle with God the Father and God the Son, is it? The Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father. It goes both ways. This is the kind of intimacy that they have. They know each other, and there's never any doubt about the things that they know. Jesus in this prayer, verses 25 through 27, he's boasting about the Father's authority, he's boasting about the Father's character, and he's boasting about the Father's intimacy. If there's any sprig of loneliness in your heart this morning, notice what else Jesus does. The fourth and final thing in this prayer, he boasts in our intimacy. Do you see how we're wrapped up in this prayer? Do you see the uh, the human effort in verse 25? That we might use all of the wisdom at our disposal and all of the understanding and intellect that we have access to in order to pursue this kind of intimacy with God the Father. And Jesus says, no, you're present as a child. You see, Jesus is present in that relationship not as a child, But we are children, not childish, but we are children who have been brought into a relationship with this perfect Father. You see, we don't get intimacy through effort, through work. Can you find encouragement in that? You don't have intimacy with God through effort. No, you're a child You bring nothing to the equation but problems. But he loves his child. Isn't verse 27 challenging and exciting at the same time? The son chooses to reveal the father to us. How does he do this? How does he choose? How does he reveal? The word reveal shows up twice. But the things of the father and the father himself is revealed by the Son so that children can stop working at intimacy through wisdom and understanding. But to, what does it mean to see something that has been revealed? It means to sit and watch, to look, to pay attention. 
If there's any work or effort, that's it. Seeing the Father through how He has revealed Himself in the Son. We might add to not just seeing, but, it's, but uh, the Father reve- is revealed to us um, in uh, not, just, not with our eyes, but with our ears as well. Jesus, what has He been doing? He's been preaching and He's been teaching. And all of this is a revelation of who the Father is. Little children never need to work at anything. Watch. Pay attention. You understand, Jesus, he is God's power to provide rest for his children and the world. This is a different kind of city, isn't it? In the first few verses of this prayer, we're talking about a city that's not inhabited by uh, many gods, but a city that is inhabited with children. That's God's city. We're children. Watch the Father and the Son. They know that the Father has authority. They know the Father's character. They know that the Father and the Son have intimacy, and they are brought into that intimacy through the work of another The parent providing for the child. The prayer changes though, doesn't it? You see in verse 28, it becomes a lot less prayerful. It's something else. It's a a, a teaching ministry of Jesus rather than uh, a prayer. And so we move from uh, 28 to 30. We move to see Jesus actually making an invitation. Actually making an invitation. You see, we began with a city full of little gods, a city that needs to be judged. And then that prayer has taught us that there's such a thing as a city that is full of children. Children being informed because the Son is revealing the Father. And here's the final point of the sermon, verses 28 through 30. Every city, a city full of children, a city of followers of God, but also a city full of little gods, those who have rejected Jesus. Every city, in verses 28 through 30, is invited to rest. I want to ask you who you think Jesus is speaking to in verse 28. That's a very serious question, by the way. Who's he speaking to in verse 28? Come to me. Who is this? I don't think he's in prayer any longer. He's teaching. But what if Jesus is in the city of Capernaum? That's the city in which much of his ministry was done. What if he is in that very city? The city in which he has just pronounced denunciation. And now he makes an invitation. The committed citizens of a city full of gods. Maybe that's the city that Jesus goes to. To preach and reveal the Father. Well, what should God the Father, the Lord of heaven and earth, do to a city that's full of gods? Judge them? One day. One day. Jesus will come. And he'll judge the living and the dead. No one will escape that judgment. One day. But right now, there's an invitation that needs to be made to the entire world. And church, we're called up into the mission of Jesus to do exactly that. If it is a city full of little miniature gods who hate Jesus, we're called to go to that city and make the invitation of verse 28. See what Jesus is doing. Jesus is doing just a couple of things here. At Jesus, he's inviting those who are carrying too much. Jesus has an invitation to those who are carrying too much. You see what Jesus says in verse 28. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. You know, that word for heavy laden is actually unusual in the Bible. But when we see it, we ought to think about the the heavy laden ministry of religious leaders. Many in the city of Capernaum would have known exactly what that was like. You want to have a relationship with God? Do these things. Do we say that to each other as Christians? We most certainly do. 
We present to Christians a a way in which uh, they become favorable in God's eyes. And each time we do that, we begin to uh, pull back the grace that has been offered by God. And we make people heavy laden. And Jesus says to them, come to me. The religious leaders load people up with burdens too heavy to carry. And Jesus says, you cannot do this. Nobody is saved by their religious duties. And Christianity can really feel like this sometimes. You see, in Capernaum, if there are believers that are hearing, disciples, those who sincerely believe in Jesus, do they still need to hear this offer? Yes, they do. Because in the Christian life, what do we do? We walk around and we pick up these labors. What do I want almost more than anything, even as a Christian? I want to earn my way into heaven. I want to be better than the person who's sitting or standing next to me. And Jesus says, lay them down. Lay them down. Now, by the way, you don't have to just be a Christian to understand what that means. If you're someone who is a part of that city of God, of, of gods, uh, people who refuse to receive Jesus, uh, what does that expression mean to you? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, you don't just reject Jesus and then have no burdens in life. That's not how life in this world works. Every human being is carrying some burden or two or three or a million. Every human being is measuring themselves based on themselves. It's what humans do. And so Jesus, he can look at a Christian body and he can say, lay those burdens down. What a beautiful gospel-centered reminder. But Jesus looks at the world and he says the same thing. You just think it's a resume, but you've placed all your trust in it and it has become to you a burden. You just think it's a paycheck, but you've placed all your trust in money and it has become a burden. Your popularity, your status, all of those things that you use for a sense of peace and happiness in this world, Jesus says that's a burden if I'm not there. I'm the one who gives you liberty, not just from the dangerous oppressors, but liberty from yourself. I will give you rest. You can't. In about a minute and a half, I've just described Jesus offering the same message and it can be heard as a message of great grace and beauty and it can be heard as a message of denunciation and judgment. That's Christianity. Because nobody is religiously unaffiliated. Everyone is holding on to something for salvation. And Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. You see what Jesus does here in our passage, verse 29. Jesus, he offers them a new yoke. I'm not sure that any Christian here has made that a part of their evangelistic ministry. I am here to tell you about a yoke. Uh, It might work, maybe with a clever website. But Jesus says, take my yoke. And a yoke, everyone would understand, is a farm implement that makes wild, crazy animals comply. You put it on an animal and it guides the animal. It makes the animal obey. And Jesus, he's not not offering to uh, simply remove a yoke. He's offering his yoke instead. And you need to understand what Jesus is doing in verse 29. He's saying, everyone's got a yoke. No one's independent. No one is living their own life, making all of their decisions in control of their own destiny. No one is. Nobody is truly independent. Everyone has a yoke. And this is the offer of Christianity, to take a better yoke. By the way, if God is the only one creator, and every creature are created creatures, how can this not be otherwise? Everyone has a yoke. Because everyone is dependent upon God for life and breath and existence. Everyone's got a yoke. 
And Jesus says, will you wear his yoke in place of yours? And it's such a challenging expression. It's not a yoke that Jesus himself wears. Or like Jesus has a yoke and you have a yoke and you're like walking right next to each other with a yoke that goes over two uh, animals. No, Jesus is saying this is a single yoke. And he says, I want you to wear my yoke. I want you to have authority that I've received from the Father so that you might wear this yoke, which is utterly different than the yoke that you fashioned for yourself. He says that uh, this yoke is a yoke in which the, t- the one wearing the yoke is actually taught. You become a learner, a disciple. And when you wear this yoke, you're being led by someone who is gentle and humble. And they teach you with gentleness and humility. This is the kind of yoke in which you don't feel its weight. You instead feel rest. Not just physical rest, rest for your souls. A yoke that seems to break the material properties of the world. You put it on and you're lighter. And as Christians, we actually need this reminder. When all the circumstances of life just begin to swirl feverishly around us, we don't know which end is up, which end is down. Isn't it good to have a brother or a sister or a pastor or an elder to remind you that the yoke of Jesus is so light, especially in swirling circumstances? Wear his yoke. For someone who's not a believer yet, we need to convince them by God's grace that they do have a yoke that is on them. And that yoke, it has power over them. It's ruling and controlling and guiding them. But we need to remind them that it's not a personal yoke. It's not a yoke that is humble and gentle. By the way, just survey your friends and ask them, are you humble and gentle towards yourself? Are you humble and gentle towards yourself? Aren't we just bloody awful to ourselves? You can ask that to someone who has no relationship with Jesus. Not only are you wearing a yoke, but that yoke is never more gentle than the yoke, the yoke of Jesus. Drop that yoke. And Christianity, and it invites you to take up a yoke that is true rest. And by the way, how do you think Jesus' yoke came to him? Hasn't he told us in the prayer He says that all things have come to him by God the Father. And Jesus is not the risen from the dead yet. But this is the work that Jesus does to give you a yoke that is rest for your souls. Because Jesus obeys God perfectly. Perfectly righteous. And God gives to him an authority that he as son deserves. He worked for that. He is someone who satisfies God. Wouldn't you like to wear a yoke that instead of saying one day you'll be someone, one day you'll have rest, to instead have a yoke that says you have it. It's done. Nothing more is needed. Jesus is God's power To provide rest for his children and the entire world. And I want to finish with this. This is a very powerful invitation. I hope you hear that. If you're not sure if you are wearing the yoke of Jesus or not, this is worth investigating. It's worth asking yourself if you've considered the yoke of Jesus and the doctrine of Christianity. Because what the Bible says about your life without Jesus It's both unkind, hard to hear, but true. Jesus is the only way. The Christian life uh, in this present age, brothers and sisters, we understand that life is difficult and we don't always feel as though we're wearing the yoke of Jesus. And we want to be able to be the kind of body here at King's Cross where as Christians we can share that with one another. I know that I have Jesus' yoke, but I don't feel it and I haven't felt it in a while. 
We need to have the kind of community where as Christians we can share with one another in that way. There are things about us that we don't have to hold tightly to because they are assured to us by the Holy Spirit. But we waver and we wander. And we need to be preaching the gospel to each other so that we would remember who we are in Jesus Christ. I'm quick to pick up some religious duty to measure myself. I'm quick to pick up the yoke of my non-believing colleague or neighbor. And I need brothers and sisters to remind me of who I am. Because the Bible says that every person who rejects Jesus is affirming their own godlike majesty. But at the same time, the Bible says that everyone who wears a yoke must be wearing a yoke of Jesus if they are going to have eternal life. Jesus alone is God's power to provide rest for his children and rest to the world. Would you join me in prayer?